All right. Well, thank you for being here. It's an honor to be with you. How, you. how many years ago did this happen to you, Bill? In uh, November 23rd, 1998. So 98. Wow, wow, wow. So I wanted Annette to be here because um, I, I saw you share a little bit. You were there in the house when this happened. Yes. So um, I'm going to get Bill to start at the beginning in just a moment. But tell us, if you will, when you, after all of this happened, this encounter, this 23 minutes, and you came into, I guess you came into the room where he was, you know, you know him very well. Kind of describe him to our audience before he tells his story, because he would be kind of like the last person you think this would happen to, right? Exactly, Joni. I mean, if anyone who knows Bill knows he's very calm, consistent, steady as he goes, his whole <laughs> life he's been that way. So for something like this to happen was totally out of the box for him and, and out of his comfort zone. Yeah, so how would you describe him? He's, he's very contemplative, cognitive, very smart. Very? Not, not really emotional? No, he's not real emotional. <laughs> <laughs> he's a very, more kept to himself, yeah. conservative, humble man. And he, yeah. this is just, yeah, this was way out of the box. For okay, him. so I know when this happened to you, there was a, an, a period of time you never spoke about it. Is that true? How long did it take you before you started telling the story? Well, I told my best friend and he asked me to come to a, a Bible study. Okay. And I reluctantly went after three months. Okay. So it took me about three months to go and I thought, well, okay, I'll share it one time at this Bible study. Well, that didn't work out so good. It spread from there. But <laughs> uh, anyway, but the point is, I knew he would believe me. I do, I do really want to share this. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go back to that fateful day. What happened that night? We went to a prayer meeting that we attended every Sunday night, nothing unusual about the night. And we came home, I went to bed, and I got up at three o'clock in the morning just to get a glass of water. And suddenly- There's something about that three o'clock. Yeah. yeah. I'll just say. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I got up to get a glass, and I, suddenly I was pulled out of my body, just like being drawn up out of your body. And I found myself falling through the air down this long tunnel, and it was getting hotter and hotter. Now, you were a Christian. I was a Christian for 28 years at that point. Wow. Okay, okay. So this was a vision. This was not a near-death experience. This was an out-of-body experience that would be classified as a vision. You know, Paul, when he was caught up in heaven in a vision in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 2, he said, whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Right. Well, the Lord showed me that I left my body. And so you can actually travel, like Paul and John traveled to heaven. And uh, Job 7, 14 says, you scare me with dreams and terrify me through visions. Mm. So you can have a terrifying vision. And I saw my body fall to the floor when I left my body. Wow. So tumbling down this tunnel, I landed on a stone floor in a prison cell in hell. Rough hewn stone walls, bars, but like a dungeon. And there's many scriptures. I just gave one, Isaiah 24, 22 says, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. And many others I could give you, but uh, that's why I first found myself down on the floor. And the first thing I noticed was the intense heat it was so far beyond the ability to sustain life. I wondered, how could I be alive? I should be dead in this heat. Well, my reaction was to get up and run out of this prison cell. But I had no physical strength in my body whatsoever. But see, Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, Art thou become weak as we? And Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. Mm. So one of the things you endure in hell is completely void of any kind of physical strength. Oh. And I looked up and I saw these two demons in the cell. They were reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body, a huge jaw, sunken in eyes, claws about a foot long. And these particular two are about 12 or 13 feet tall. There's scripture for that too, but uh, they were blaspheming and cursing God. They had an extreme hatred for God and then directed that hatred towards me. The one picked me up, threw me into the wall of this prison cell. I collapsed on the floor. I wondered why should I, I, I should be dead through that. Um, I noticed I had a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, fear him who was able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Remember Luke 16, the rich man, he had a mouth to speak and he had a tongue. Yeah. And the other demon dug his claws into my chest, just tore the flesh open. I, I could not believe this was actually happening. I, I, so what, no, what did you look like physically as that was happening? I look like I do now. Uh, it appeared at least. Now, I was there in a vision, so that may be a little different than what those people right. But what did your are. body look like when, they, when he threw you up against the wall and when he began to tear at your flesh? Well, it, I felt as if every bone had broken in my body. 
and also the flesh, when he tore the flesh open, there was no blood or water coming from the wounds. It was just all dry. But see, Leviticus 17, 11 says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Yeah. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. Wow. And Zechariah 9, 11 says, thy prisoner is out of the pit where there is no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. And these demons have no mercy over you whatsoever, an extreme hatred for mankind. Now, about this time, it went dark. Now, I believed it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see, but he withdrew his light and it resumed its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness. Lamentations 3, 6 and many other scriptures talk about the darkness, but it wasn't just dark. You can actually feel the darkness. What are you thinking at this time? Well, I didn't know why I was there or how I got there. Uh, nothing was revealed until the way back. And so I was there, though I have to explain, I was there as like an unsaved person would be, even though I was saved. Mm. God blocked it from my mind that I was a Christian. He hid that fact from me. You say, where's that in the Bible? In Luke 24, 16, when Jesus appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it says their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Mm. John MacArthur's commentary and Matthew Henry's point out that they were kept by God from recognizing him. So God hid it from their minds and he hid it from my mind for this reason. See, if I was there as a Christian, which I was, but I didn't know, I would have known, praise God, he's getting me out of here. Yeah. Right? I would have known that as a Christian. Yeah. But as an unsaved person, he wanted me to experience what they feel, hopelessness. See, Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And we know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They have no hope for him because it's too late. And that's the worst part of hell, understanding you'll never get out. And, uh, but anyway, I was, I was taken out of that prison cell, placed next to this large raging pit of fire, like I said. And this is where I could first see people inside this pit. There were thousands of people burning and screaming. Now, you could not identify a man from a woman. It just looked like skeletons with uh, flesh hanging off their bones. And the screams are so loud, you want to get away from that, but you can't. You have to endure that. Isaiah 57, 21 says, there's no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There's no peace of any kind. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to talk to a person, just to, you know, this pleasure in conversation. But even though those people are in the pit, they're all kept at a distance. You have no conversation. You're just isolated and by yourself. I had my full memory. I thought about my wife up on the earth. And I knew I would never see her again and never get to say goodbye to her. And you don't realize what a tormenting thought that is to have no finality with your family. See, Job 7.9 says, he that goes down to Sheol shall come up no more. You understand that. You're not going to get out. And to never see her again, never hold her, never tell her I love her, uh, that thought was extremely tormenting. I knew, there were, I knew I was down deep in the earth. I understood that. Uh, there's 49 scriptures that point out where the current hell is. Um, I just give two, Ezekiel 26, 20, number 16, 32, and 33. Uh, I understood there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. Did you learn all those scriptures and memorize them after this experience? I did. Yeah. I studied it for about seven years before the book was ever written, and the publisher asked me to write the book. So it was not something I wanted to self-promote, yeah. but I was happy to write the book because that's what's important for people to believe. It doesn't matter if they believe me. I'm just a signpost to point them to the scriptures. Wow. Okay, so continue on. You're there at the, at the, the pit, the, yeah. and you're seeing people scream. I know that all of your senses were arrested in a way that was just mind-boggling, not only yes. what you heard, right. but talk about the other senses, how you felt. The stench in hell. You know, Jesus rebuked the foul spirits, Mark 9, 25. These demons have a disgusting, foul, putrid odor to them, but also the smell of burning sulfur. And if you go to Hawaii to the volcano, they have signs posted where you cannot go past a certain point because the toxicity coming up from the volcano, it's toxic, it will kill you. Well, sulfur is just another word for brimstone. And the word brimstone is all through the Bible. So you're breathing in this foul, putrid, disgusting air that you don't want to breathe. But it's even worse than that because there's not enough air to breathe. You have to fight for even the tiniest bit of oxygen. But Isaiah 42, 5 says, the Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth. You're down deep beneath the earth. I think you described kind of what that looked or felt like, trying to breathe. Can yeah. you show everyone what that was like? Yes. It was like... <coughs> that was as much air as you could get. Wow. So any moment you feel like you're going to suffocate. Yeah. And you're exhausted. Uh, you have no physical strength. And you need to sleep in hell. Like here we need sleep, right? Mm -hmm. I felt like I was there 23 weeks without going to sleep. Wow. And you need to sleep just like we do here. Yeah. But you can imagine after two days here, you can't function. Yeah. Well, in hell, 
you need to sleep. But, you know, Revelation 14, 10, 11 says, and they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and in the presence of the holy angels. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Now, no rest from the torment, but no rest of any kind, because Isaiah 57, 20 says, the wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. But see, rest is a blessing from God. Yeah. Psalms 127, 2 said, the Lord gives his beloved sleep, but you're not his beloved. She don't derive the benefit of even sleep. What about the presence of God that is on the earth? Like even as we were singing just a while ago, you could sense the presence of God. And to some of you have been watching right now, you sense the presence of God. If that's on the earth that we don't even realize. Right. Psalms 33, 5 says, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. We get to enjoy his goodness here, but in hell, uh, his attributes are withdrawn from hell. That's why hell is so horrible. See, hell's dark because 1 John 1, 5 said, God's light. There's only death in hell because John 1, 4 said, God is life. Mm -hmm. There's only hatred in hell because 1 John 4, 16 said, God is love. Mm -hmm. There's no mercy in hell because Psalms 36, 5 says, the mercy of the Lord's in the heavens. There's no strength in hell because Psalms 18, 32 said, it's the Lord that gives us strength. There's no water in hell because Deuteronomy 11, 11 says, water is the rain of heaven. And there's no peace in hell because Isaiah 9, 6 says, he's the prince of peace. So see, if God removes himself from the situation, all the good goes with him. You can't have the good without God. Yeah. So people don't realize all the good we enjoy comes from God. It's James 1, 17. Okay, so at this point, you're there by the pit, you're seeing this, you, you have to be feeling utter despair. Like yeah. when you look at your body, could you see your body? What did it look like? And what, you know, what happened after that? Well, it looks similar. And I was looking at all these people being tormented by demons. The stench, <clears throat> I was standing on a bed of maggots. You know, Isaiah 14, 11 talks about the maggots spread under thee and the worm will cover thee. People were being uh, consumed by maggots. And so I was observing all that. And then something began lifting me up this tunnel, this dark tunnel. And um, in this pitch black darkness, and suddenly this bright light appeared. Now I knew immediately who it was. You have no doubt when Jesus shows up who he is. I didn't see his face. I just saw the outline of a man standing in a bright, pure, holy light, but like no light I have ever seen. And I just called out his name. I just said, Jesus. And he just said two words. He said, I am. And when he said that, at, I, I went out. I don't know if I died or passed out. I can only explain that through Revelation 1.16. When John saw him, he said his countenance was bright as the sun, and I fell at his feet as one dead. Well, after time, he touched me. And when I came to, I was at his feet, Joni, and it hit me so strongly, even though I'd been a Christian for 28 years at that point, I was so grateful that he went to the cross. Because if he didn't, I would be in that place for all eternity. I didn't want to ask him any questions. I just want to thank him and praise him and praise him. And, but after a time, thoughts started coming to my mind and he would answer my thoughts. And I had eight different thoughts. He answered all of them. Tell us what they yeah. were. Well, the first thought was, Lord, why did you send me to this horrible place? Yeah. He said, because many people do not believe hell is real. He said, even some of my own people do not believe hell exists. Now that statement surprised me because I thought all Christians believe in hell. But we have found out since many believe in universalism, which is teaching us as everybody gets saved, right. or annihilationism that says that if you don't receive Jesus, you're just simply annihilated, or soul sleep, many false teachings. So um, he wanted me to point people to the scriptures that there really is a, an eternal hell. And it's far worse than people can imagine. So to go take us through, can you remember all eight thoughts? Yes. Okay. Um, I thought, Lord, um, why did those demons hate me so much? He said, because you're made in my image and they hate me. Remember, Jesus said in John 15, 18, they hated me before they hated you. Demons hate God, but they can't hurt him, but they can hurt his creation. And I thought, Lord, uh, I don't want to tell anybody about this experience. They're going to think I'm crazy or had a bad dream. He said, it's not your job to convict their hearts. It's the Holy Spirit's. He said, you just go and tell them. I said, yes, sir, I will. But I have to admit, I complained for seven years. My wife and I traveled. We were invited around the country. You complained? Annette, did he complain? <laughs> he did. He, he didn't did. like to travel. He's oh. a very routine well, person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so. also, hell was so severe, I thought, I'm not a good enough speaker to get across to people how severe it is. 
And besides, I had a real estate business. I was making a lot of money, and I didn't want to go do this. We paid our own way for seven years. We never took one penny from anybody traveling. We were invited all over the country to speak. And then, like I said, the publisher asked me to write the book. But again, I was happy to write the book because of scriptures. But uh, yeah, I did complain. I said, Lord, I feel uncomfortable. I'm too conservative a person. And one day the Lord, I heard his voice say to me, Bill, it's not about you being comfortable. It's about you being obedient. Man, that convicted my heart. I felt so bad, I repented, and I said, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm honored you would give me something like this to do. And now it doesn't matter if I feel uncomfortable, because if one person can come to the light of the scripture and get saved, then they can avoid this horrible place. And it's worth any uncomfortableness I would ever feel. So what were the other thoughts? Well, before you say that, I'm gonna say this. I remember in Jim Woodford's testimony of when he went to heaven and he met his guardian angel. Well, mm -hmm. actually three angels appeared and you'll have to watch the whole story. But when they appeared before him, there was just kind of an honoring that they did, not like a worship or anything, but just kind of an honoring where they, they bowed slightly. And it was just like you, he thought, he thought to himself, why? Are, why are they doing that? And the angel looked at him and said, because when we look at you, we see our creator. And we well, are powerful. created yes. in his image. Right. Okay, so finish telling your thoughts and then I'm gonna have you go back. I know you don't want to, but I want you to go back into hell and just tell more about what you saw and what kind of place it really is. Okay. I thought, um, Lord, you know, why did you pick me? But he never gave me an answer for that one. He didn't, he didn't answer. I have Sometimes no idea. he doesn't answer. <laughs> right. I'm the least likely. Like, you know, I thought he made a mistake, you know, but the mistake in God don't. No, go even talking well to you right now, you see why the Lord picked exactly. him. Exactly. Because it makes you more believable. Because exactly. you wouldn't be the sensational, yeah. like, bless God, I'm here to preach. You right. know, I mean, mm -hmm. you're just, you're so, you are so conservative and, you know, and just more your demeanor and all. I can see exactly why the Lord picked you. And even the fact that you've memorized all these scriptures. They go with every detail of what you saw to back up it being truth. Um, that to me is, is such a testimony as well. But anyway, continue on. Well, I, I always respected the word of God and I, I just want to people, point people to the word, not, not my experience. But I thought, Lord, uh, again, I said, Lord, why didn't I know you? Remember, I, but I explained that to yeah. you already. Yeah. So I could experience the hopelessness. I thought, Lord, those demons were so powerful. And, but now when uh, Jesus appeared, the demons that were on the wall of this cavern, they appeared to be like ants, really tiny. And I don't know if they really were that small or they just appeared that way. I think the, they appeared that way because the Lord wanted me to see in the name of, with the name of Jesus, they're nothing. Yeah. There's no power compa mm. compared to the power we have in the name of Jesus. Can we just wow. say thank you, Lord, for that? We sang the right song today, didn't we? Yeah. Last week, Jesus. Because in, see, as an ant, we would just step on an ant, right? Be nothing to us. Right. That's how he wanted them to appear to me. He said, all you have to do is cast them out in my name. It was so matter of fact, like they're not that powerful. If you're walking with Jesus, wow. then they're nothing. And so that was a real revelation. <laughs> I love you know, that. To see okay, that. Okay, continue on. And uh, we went above the earth and uh, looked back at the earth. And it, that was amazing just to be above the earth. But people were falling one after another after another back down this tunnel we just came out of. And he allowed me to feel a piece of his heart, the anguish he feels for a soul falling into hell. I couldn't even stand to feel a little bit because his love, Ephesians 3.19 says, his love passes knowledge. He loves us far more than we can love our own family members. Wow. And I said, Lord, I don't want to feel what you're feeling. But he wanted me to remember that the anguish he feels because he's entrusted us as Christians with the gospel. So if we would share the truth, many people could avoid it. And that's what he has empowered us to do is preach the word of God. So they don't have to, many, as many people don't have to fall down that tunnel and into hell. Mm -hmm. And so um, he allowed me to feel, and that was probably the most uh, important aspect of this vision was feeling a piece of God's heart. And I don't know if I could share this real quickly, but he opened up a scripture to me in Psalms 139, 17 and 18. David said, your thoughts toward me are all precious. And I suppose if I should count them, they are more than the sands. Now we look at that and say, oh, that's nice. But he opened that up to me. He said, if you picked up a handful of sand, there'd be thousands of granules in your hand, right? Yeah. If each one represented a thought. And I said, I love how my wife prays for me all the time. I love how she prays for her parents. I love how beautiful she is. I love how she honors her parents. You came back three or four hours from now, and I'm trying to exhaust, exhaust the amount. You would say Bill's really gone over his wife, right? 
That's just the amount in my hand. <laughs> and see, he said his thoughts towards us are more than all the sands on the whole earth. Oh. <laughs> and see, that's not an exaggeration because God can't exaggerate. Yeah. So his thoughts are all precious for every person more than the sands on the whole earth. Now you can see why his love passes knowledge and he doesn't want people to go to hell. You know, so God's a loving God. He's trying to keep people out of hell. But he also wants people to know how severe it is so that they can avoid it. Yeah. You know, a lot of churches aren't talking about hell and they're not told what they're saved from. Yeah. And you know, that's what we're saved from. Right. You know, you think about the <clears throat> fact that he loved us so much that he made provision for us not to go there. Right. Because for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, um, but he sent his only son to die on the cross and shed his blood for our sins. All we have to do is receive Jesus, repent of our sins, believe that he died on the cross for our sins and allow and ask him to come into our heart and life. And to, it is the greatest miracle really that takes place in somebody's life. And I've prayed that prayer a million times, it seems like with people over the years on television in person, but uh, it never gets old because uh, there's nothing more important than that we preach the gospel to every living creature. Daystar goes around the world. There are people watching right now, Bill, that if they were to die at this moment, they're not sure where they would go. So I want you just to take a moment, if you will, look in the camera and lead us in a sinner's prayer. Uh, just say whatever you feel the Holy Spirit leading you to say, and we'll repeat after you. And I want you to listen to what Bill has to say. And somebody said, well, you scared me out of hell. Good. That's just why we're doing this today, because you need to really know it's, it's a real place. And um, you will never forget hearing this story uh, because... It's so important to us for you to know the truth and for you to be set free and for you to make heaven your home because heaven's another whole story that is amazing. But anyway, go ahead, Bill, as you feel directed. You know, Revelation 20, 15 says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God actually has a book and he's gonna look to see if your name is in his book. And God loves you, but because he loves you, he gives you a free will to choose. If you want to choose today, you can have your name written in his book. And all you have to do is say this prayer. And this doesn't mean just, oh, fit Jesus in your life. I'm talking about a commitment to the Lord yes. where you truly turn from your sin and turn to God and trust in him as your Lord and Savior. If you're willing to do that and just say this prayer, say, dear God in heaven, Dear God, God in, heaven. in heaven, I know that I've sinned, I know that that I've sinned. and I cannot save myself. And I, cannot cannot save myself. myself. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for me, that he was crucified, that he was crucified. Died, and was died and was buried, but rose again, but rose again. and lives forevermore. And lives forevermore. I, ask I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I, ask you to forgive me of my sins. I repent. I repent. Come, into my heart. Come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I receive you as my Lord and you are the Son of God. You are the Son of God. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for dying. Thank you for taking me to heaven. Thank you for taking me to heaven. And I now confess. And I now confess. I'm a born again Christian. I'm a born again Christian. Going to heaven. Going to heaven. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you said that prayer, tell somebody what you've done, because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Amen. There's a number on the screen. I really do think it is important to share when you've prayed that prayer. And uh, we have prayer partners that are standing by. I'd love to send you a free book entitled, Now What? It's in English and Spanish. What do I do now that I've prayed that prayer? But this is the important thing. There's just something about telling someone. And the Bible talks about we're, we're made overcomers by the word of our testimony. And it really strengthens us, doesn't yes. it, Bill, when yes. we share. So go to the phone right now if you prayed that prayer. Let us know so we can send you that book. You can go to daystar.com, click on prayer. Say, I prayed the prayer. Please send me the book. Leave your information. We'll send that to you. But you have just made the most important decision of your life. And some of you said, well, I prayed it maybe a long time ago, but I really haven't been living for the Lord. Hey, that was great for you to pray it again. So you just be encouraged today and know that God hears you when you pray with a sincere heart, doesn't he, Susan? Absolutely. Just hearing, you know, you talk about the thoughts that God has more than the grains of sand, that, that alone should just 
be all the motivation you need that you're with right. a with a God who loves you so much. But you know, obviously with God, it's perfect love and it casts out all fear. And then the opposite of that without God is complete and total fear. Was there anything on earth you experienced, uh, the, the fear that you felt in hell? Was there anything on earth that even, you know, compared? Yes, yeah, good question. You know, the fear is so far beyond anything we can imagine here on earth. And I know something about fear. When I was 17 years old, I used to surf a lot. And I was attacked by a 10-foot tiger shark. Wow. And the shark bit my board in half, grabbed my leg, and pulled me down under the water. Whoa. So you can imagine the fear that I felt at that moment. Even though you haven't been through it, you can at least imagine it. Did you look the shark in the eye? Well, oh yeah, I mean, it was up, up close and personal. Whoa. And, um, but when he pulled me down under the water, the fear that I felt at that moment, that paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. It wouldn't even register in hell. But see, Psalm 73, 18 and 19 says, you cast them down into destruction where they are utterly consumed with terror. You're consumed with this terror for all eternity. So that fear stays up at that level uh, forever in hell. Wait, so uh, that, how did you survive the shark? Were you saved at this point? No, I was not a Christian. You know, and the, a miracle happened that day. The shark not only opened his mouth and let me go, but I didn't have a mark in my leg. What? And that's impossible with tiger sharks. They're really vicious. So God was looking out for me. I was not saved, but I got saved immediately after that. So. Yeah. Listen, when Susie heard the shark story, she was going to find out about that shark story. I don't go in the ocean because of sharks. Not really. <laughs> I don't mess with that. That is a miraculous story, but you're saying that paled, like it wouldn't even register right. with what you felt for those few minutes right. that you experienced in hell. Well, I see that you're calling. Continue to call if you prayed that prayer and let us know. And you can just say, Joni, I prayed the prayer. We want to send you that book entitled, Now What? It's so important that you tell somebody. Some of you sitting there, I don't know if I'm going to call. Yes, call and let us know. Let us pray with you and encourage you today. Wow, you know, when you hear a story like this, and like I know that hell exists, but just to hear the details, it really does do something to you. And, and, and the fact that we as believers, I mean, you couldn't hate somebody enough to ever wish that on them. You That's know? right. That's right. It really wakes us up, like you said, as believers. You know, it gives us more an appreciation of what we were saved from. Yeah. It causes us to walk more in the fear of the Lord and not play around with a sinful lifestyle. And it gives us more of that passion for the lost, a desire to want to witness. And we're all called to do that. Yeah. Jesus told us to go in all the world and preach the gospel. Yes. That's not just for you or pastors. It's for all of us. So what were some of the other uh, feelings, emotions, thoughts that you felt when you were in hell? How, how long did you feel like you were in the cell before you were right there in front of the pit? You know, I can't tell how long that was. I, I can't. I, I know I was there. It felt like 23 Could weeks. Could you stand? For the whole Could you stand? I, I stood up, but barely. It took so much effort to stand up. I mean, you have no physical strength in your body at all. And um, so you're, the, the demons have great strength. You have none. You know, that demon threw me into the wall like I weighed the weight of a water glass. And uh, so you, you can't defend yourself. But you couldn't anyway. They have much greater strength than you do. But you have no purpose. It's just a complete useless wasting away in hell. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says there's no work, no device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. So it's a waste. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you're somebody famous here. No one would know who you are there. You have no identity. Ecclesiastes 6, 4, she says your name's covered in darkness and you're forgotten in hell. Psalms 88, 12, Isaiah 26, 14, Deuteronomy 32, 26 point out that, you know, it's an awful thing to be forgotten because you understand down there, no one's given you a thought up on the earth, right? I mean, do you think about anybody in hell? Not really, you know, and um, like I said, I thought about my wife and you never get to say goodbye to your loved ones, no finality. Um, those demons twisted, deformed. Like I said, some are small, and um, but they're all grotesque looking. Some were 12 and 13 feet tall, like the ones that were in my prison cell that I was in. And um, they all have this extreme hatred for mankind. And um, they really, they want to destroy you. They want to torment you in hell. And, and they do. So uh, it's that you have to endure that. The loneliness, the being by yourself, uh, the darkness is so intense. I mean, when, it, when the Lord left and it resumed its normal state, the darkness just penetrates through every cell in your body. 
it's, it's, you know, like it says, uh, Ecclesiastes talks about a darkness that may be felt. You know, Exodus 10, 21, I mean, uh, there's a, a darkness that actually will penetrate through every cell in your body. It, that's how it is there. It's so evil and wicked. What was worse, the smell, the what you saw, what you heard, what you felt? What was the worst I mean, as far as all the senses? Well, the worst was actually the hopelessness, was as far as that goes, the feeling, knowing that you'll never escape it. See, because like I said here, you can always die to get out of pain. But in hell, there's no Calvary coming over the hill. There's no angels to rescue you. There's no God to come save you. But you grasp that. You understand that here we can't quite grasp eternity. But in hell, you can. You can understand it will never end and you'll never escape. Yeah. And that is really what I want to sink into people. You know, a lot of people don't understand when God creates an eternal soul, it's an eternal soul. Right. You can't undo that. No. It's it's a soul that's going to live forever. So at some point, you came back, I guess, into the room where you were, and you had had all of that happen, including talking to Jesus, which was probably amazing. Uh, Annette, jump in here and tell us, when did you realize something happened? Well, I, I, I was sound asleep in our bed. Okay. And I awoke to screens coming from our living room. And the first thing I did is I looked at our digital clock, which read 323. So I got up and went down the hallway, and I found Bill in a state that I had never, ever seen him in. He was trauma. He looked traumatized. He looked like he was dying. He was in a fetal position. He just holding his hands to his head, screaming in terror. So I did think I need to call emergency services. He's dying. And then Bill began to cry out, pray for me, pray for me. The Lord has taken me to hell. And so I just started to pray for him. And God very graciously took away the fear and the torment. After about 20 minutes or so, he started to calm down. And then that's when he asked for a glass of water. So uh, you had never seen him in that kind of state before? No, never. I mean, he is calm. He's conservative. (laughs) He's very um, not emotional. You know, Bill's not (laughs) given over to that. He's always been very steady, a businessman. I mean, he was a real real estate broker for his whole career. And yeah, never seen him So when he told you the story, what did you think? Well, I believed him honestly right away. I mean, we had dated for a while before we had been married. At that point, we were married one year and two weeks. Okay. So I did totally believe him because I knew his character. I knew Bill. Yeah. He's, I mean, I heard from all his clients and his friends before we even got married what a man of integrity he was. So, yeah, yeah I did, had no doubt wow. that something wow. supernatural had happened to him. That's really something. So what would you say... Bill, to family members who have unsaved family members, just talk up for just about a minute and and encourage them. You know, I have family members too that aren't saved. And um, I would just say to you, just be diligent to pray for them, even fast for them and be the best influence you can. You know, you can't, it's difficult to witness to family, but you can as your example. And so I would just encourage you to be steadfast in the prayer for them and pray that God would send labors across their path, other people that they would respect and listen to, and pray that God would give them a dream or a vision. Uh, But if you pray and fast, really be diligent with your praying, not just a little simple prayer, but I mean get on your knees and cry out to God and say, Lord, my family members cannot go to hell. Lord, please save them, Father. Arrest their attention, speak to their heart, open up their heart and ears to the truth. God will find a way to get through to them. So I encourage you to don't give up on your family. Be strong and God will rescue them.